Elizabeth Taylor and Elizabeth Richard Burton. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. My name is Arden. Oh, yes, Mr. Arden. Hmm? Sorry. We're going to just ride in some time, walk in the bank and just take it. That's right. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> You knew it the instant our eyes first met, and everything within us met. And you know it now. You have no right to say that, to talk like this, please. You can't help yourself any more than I. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen, joined, as always, by the awesome Samantha. Samantha, how are you? I'm great, ready to ring in this new year. And say goodbye to however horribly we want to describe 2022. (laughs) I'm ready as well. It's a first episode of a new year, so we are talking about our 2022 new discoveries, the classic films that we discovered for the first time. Last year, we don't have a guest, but we are going to be supplementing that by increasing our usual top three to a top five, (gasps) which I think was actually still incredibly hard for you and I to come up with five. Yeah, I'm staring at my full list. It's 24. Mine was 30. So I'm right there with you. Before we talk about that, though, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features, looking at remakes, and based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. We recently finished our holiday series, Six Weeks with the Thin Man, looking at all six of the Thin Man episodes in chronological order. We talked about everything from wartime cinema to Leon Ames' hot jazz daddy. It was an adventure, that's for sure. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. You can head over to patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And don't forget to pre-order my book coming out on March 7th. But have you read the book 52 Literary Gems that inspired our favorite movies? You can pre-order that wherever you get your books. Put it on your Goodreads. Order it from your local library, however you do it. And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art all designed by our own Samantha Ellis featuring your favorite stars, including our popular item, which was our Jean and Judy Makoko Cocoa Mugs. You can see those at redbubble.com slash people slash ticklish biz. Enough promoting us. Let's talk about the movies that we fell in love with in 2022. Samantha, I want to talk about your process. We talk about process every time we do these. Was it different than in previous years? How easy was it for you to even conjure up a list? It was definitely difficult this year because the first thing that I noticed looking at my letterbox was that I watched the same exact number of films this year as I did last year. It really doesn't feel like it though because I had so many rewatches this year. I watched a lot of comfort movies. I was introducing a lot of the really big old Hollywood movies to people I know. It was almost a little bit difficult to find those new to me movies, but then they really started adding up. And this year, honestly, more than any other recent year, I crossed off a lot of big, I really should have seen this already type of movies. So you'll hear a lot about that. Half of my list is going to be what the heck? How did you not see this movie? (laughs) This was a weird year for me because I did watch less movies than I did the year before. So in 2021, If we're talking about classic films, I watched 187. This year, I only made it to 171, which is only one more than I watched in 2020. And yet, I think I watched stuff more deliberately this year. I made a point of making sure that I was paying attention to what I was watching as opposed to just clicking it on the background and not really caring. And I did also see a lot more in theater. So whether that was the Academy or the New Beverly or any of the rep cinemas here, So it was shockingly easy for me to come up with a solid 10. There was stuff I liked. Overall, my list was about 30. But when I started to look at the 30, narrowing it down to 10 was remarkably easy for me, which shameless plug, you can read my long list of the full 10 over at ticklishbiz.com, our website. 
I'm excited to see which movies, because I looked at your letterbox, Samantha, and yes, I said numerous times, how have you been on this podcast for as long as you have and not seen this? So I'm excited to see what you narrowed that list down to for the five that you picked. I'm going to have you start us off and set the tone with your number five. There are some that I still was not able to include that are just so huge that people are going to get so angry at me. We're starting number five off with a really big one, okay? We've had discussions about Move Over Darling from 1963 with Doris Day. We've talked about how I've seen that movie. I had never seen until this year My Favorite Wife from 1940. I'm waiting for the gasp, the shock. I would say you're fired, but I can't (laughs) fire you. (laughs) I'm shocked. I'm shocked and appalled because I've seen remakes and not haven't seen the original, but that's a big one. That's a big, I haven't even seen Something's Gotta Give, the little part of a movie with Marilyn before I saw My Favorite Wife. I'm not sad. I'm just disappointed. (laughs) I really didn't know what to expect with My Favorite Wife for people who somehow also like me don't know my favorite wife (laughs) it's about this couple it's a married couple nick arden and ellen wagstaff arden ellen years ago was cast away she was swept overboard and lost never to be found but she was found a couple of years later and rescued and she returns home to her husband and children just as her husband is remarrying It's really interesting because I'd seen this with Doris Day, I'd seen this with Marilyn Monroe, to see this with Irene Dunn and Cary Grant and, oh gosh. Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott. It was so interesting. It really was almost a cookie cutter of the exact same movie that I had seen just right into the 1940s. And seeing it filmed at the Beverly Hills Hotel at their pool seeing those shots right out of the 40s was so special. I'm just going to hint, Irene Dunn and Cary Grant are going to pop up again later in this list. So I really was starting to get a nice penchant for them. They're just so dynamic in this. It's such a great comedic role for both of them. And they bounce off of each other so well. It's also incredibly gay. And I kind of love that. Yes. Anybody who emails me and says the Cary Grant Randolph Scott pool sequence is not same sex oriented. Stop. It is. And it's amazing. I love it so much. No, that is thicker in this version than any other version for sure. Oh, definitely. If you watch move over darling, there is not a hint of it. If anything, Chuck Connors, he's more lecherous of the Ellen character in move over darling than Randolph Scott is in my favorite wife. I would love for you to see Too Many Husbands, which is the gender swapped version of My Favorite Wife. What? Yes. So it's essentially the precursor to the thruple. It's Gene Arthur, Fred McMurray, and I think Melvin Douglas. Pretty sure it's Melvin Douglas. You had me at Melvin Douglas. Yes. It's essentially the same story. Husband goes missing. She's set to remarry and then he comes back. It is also incredibly, incredibly thirsty on Maine and it's delightful. I love that. I'm adding that to the watch list. I feel like I've heard the name of it, but now that I know what it is, gotta watch it. It's great. It's great. I had four through one set. I am not varying. Five, I've changed about seven times. And if you look at my long list, five that I listed there is not the five that I'm going to tell you all right now. I'm changing things in the moment. I watched a lot of foreign cinema this year, classic foreign cinema, which was a huge blind spot for me. I saw a lot of Kurosawa films this year, so I was very proud of myself. My number five is actually from 1946, and it's called Sylvia and the Ghost. It is a French film that feels like a French version of I Married a Witch in the sense that it's very high fantasy. It's a romance. It's got a little bit of a gothic bent to it, and it's just so damn delightful follows a a girl named Sylvia, played by Odette Joyo, who harbors a love for a ghost that supposedly haunts her family's castle, because of course they have a castle. Her family is committed to undoing this crush, so they hire three guys to play ghost. 
shenanigans ensue that involve an actual ghost. Feels very much like a Rene Claire high fantasy romance. They do a lot of really great Pepper's ghost effects with the guy who plays the ghost. There's some fun stuff with the sheets that move. It's got a lot of really fun 1940s visual trickery. And it's just a really fun, romantic little film about a young girl who realizes she has to grow up and put childish things aside. She's got a crush on a dead guy, which is why we do this podcast. We can relate to that. If you love stuff like the Canterville Ghost, which is not necessarily a romance because Margaret O'Brien's a child, but it's in the same vein. This is a lot of fun. It was very sweet. And the Criterion Collection actually has it. TCM showed it during Halloween, so I was happy to get a chance to check it out. That's my number five. That movie was on my list and I let it expire and now I regret it. You should definitely see it. You would really like it. It's I should. got that nice little just spooky enough, but it's so romantical. With the element of romance. That's exactly, exactly. what Exactly. I was going to say, about. you are a fan of, what's the mermaid movie we always talk about? Miranda? Mr. Peabody and the Mr. Mermaid. Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid. But there's also Miranda with Chaz Glennis Johns. It feels similar to that. It's a lot of fun. Heartily endorse that. Love that. And we got to hold up the French movies around here. International cinema, especially of this time period. Maybe, you know, British World War II films, but France and every other country was making classic films as well. So I'm glad that I got to see what they were doing around this time. And it looks remarkably, aside from the fact that they're speaking in a different language, looks like the same filmmaking styles and it's all very accessible. Samantha, what is your number four? My number four is definitely more obscure than my favorite wife. (laughs) It's a movie from 1939 called Good Girls Go to Paris. And it's one I think we both saw this year. I just It's an honorable mention on mine. See, we both appreciate the movie. It's so great. This movie is about... Jenny Swanson, played by Joan Blondell, and she's a waitress on a college campus. And she has this very interesting relationship with one of the professors that frequents this restaurant that she works at. On one hand, they have a little bit of the flirtatious banter, but in a large way, he's a father figure to her in the sense that he tries to steer her in the right direction rather than the I'm going to be a gold digger and go to Paris direction. (laughs) They end up in the same house, both marrying almost into the same family. I don't want to get too far into the plot. Them being in that same situation causes some conflict and some romantic comedy straight out of the 30s. This one is so out of the way. It's such a hidden gem. And I love Joan Blondell and Melvin Douglas together. I cannot say it enough they're the perfect 1930s pairing this was one where i wasn't necessarily pulled in by the romance although it's very sweet i liked more of the comedy of manners element to it in that joan blondell is pretty much open about the fact that she wants to fake a guy into a scandal so that she can get money to go to paris she's like i'm gonna trap this guy into marrying me and they're not gonna want to because i'm poor and they're gonna give me money which i think is a recipe for a good noir, usually. In this case, what ends up happening is she gets stuck in this wealthy family where she is both simultaneously praised and exploited for not being wealthy in very interesting ways. I like that element more than the romantic element. A lot of it is because Joan Blondell carries this movie on her freaking back. She is so good. I'm always bummed that she never became an A star in the same way as, I'm going to say it, the same way as June Allison, even though June Allison and Joan Blondell don't deserve to be on the same line together. I'm team Joan forever. I think of it more as a, why didn't she become more of a Jean Harlow in the sense of she's yeah. not as well known today, even though she was top billed in every movie of the 1930s. It's so crazy. Yeah. Watching her in this, you just realize what enigma she is in that she can do comedy, she can do drama, she can do romance. It's an interesting movie to watch in that sense of finding out which stars hit and which don't, and which in this case should have. I do have to say, though, her 
banter and her dialogue with Melvin Douglas is just unmatched in this movie. It's so cute and it's so great. I love the ending. Melvin Douglas is one of those, you really need a strong scene partner for him to not seem wooden. I don't agree. I just love him in everything. I'm so biased. He's one of my favorite 30s leading men. I appreciate him. He's writing that him. same Danish show for me, and I know oh, how see, feel about Francho. I always feel like if you couldn't get David Niven, you got Melvin Douglas. That's my thing. Hard disagree. He is more comparable to, like, a Walter Pigeon, maybe. Walter Pigeon? No. no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> way we both like the movies (laughs) we will have this grand discussion about melvin douglas at a later date future episode maybe so my number four this is not the last time you're gonna see these two in my list because this year was all about liz and dick for me i don't know how that happened actually part of it was is tcm had liz taylor on summer under the stars and so i watched quite a few if not almost everything that they showed of hers that day So my number four comes all the way from 1965. It is The Sandpiper. Please tell me you don't have this on your list. I do not. It would be an honorable mention for me. Oh my gosh. We both discovered this one this year, which is also so crazy. The Sandpiper is a movie that could have only been made in the 1960s, directed by Vincent Minnelli. I get no Minnelli in this at all, because this is a movie that is both incredibly, incredibly horny and B is so 1960s, the studio system is out of the way, we're going to go just ham. I just don't feel Minnelli vibe. If you had told me the guy who made me in St. Louis made this movie, I would not have believed you. But he did. Liz Taylor plays Laura Reynolds. She's this boho free spirit who lives in an artist colony by the ocean in California. She's raising a son and through some shenanigans, she is told you're not raising your kid right. We're going to send him to this boarding school that you have to be okay with or essentially you're going to lose custody of him. She says, okay. Through him going to the school, she meets Dr. Edward Hewitt, played by Richard Burton, who is a priest light. I don't really know how the organized religion thing works in this movie, even though I'm a lapsed Catholic, because he says he's a priest, but he's married. He's married to Eva Marie Saint, who I'm sorry, just does not have hell of a chance in this film at all she just pops in says hi reminds him that he's married and they have a child and that's really all she's there for but of course laura and edward have this undeniable chemistry and it's a romance i love it so freaking much because not only is richard burton playing a priest and i'm not saying that that is part of why i put it on this list but i'm not not saying that It's a film that just goes in so many different directions while all the while reminding you that this is supposed to be a good old fashioned love story. This is a film that has our two characters meeting clandestinely in this perfectly decked out shack slash artist cottage where there is a giant wooden statue of Liz Taylor naked throughout the entire movie. The camera is always catching the wooden boobs of Liz Taylor utterly insane on top of that there's also scuzzy dudes that want a piece of her and of course the whole flea bag s the man's a man of the cloth maybe i don't know i love it so so much everybody's hot everybody's hot and it was just so much fun to watch in all seriousness this is probably some of elizabeth taylor's finest work she gives such an intense dramatic performance you root for her. This is a character that I think 20 years before would have probably killed herself three on a match style. Sorry, spoilers. But she doesn't. She's allowed to be a single mom and raise her kid the way that she wants. Illicit love affair. And I'm all for romances where the characters maybe end up together. I don't know. So The Sandpiper. It's great. Everybody should see it as soon as possible. I loved this one too. I definitely agree. It made my top 24 list, not quite my top five. Elizabeth is great in it. It's honestly one of my new favorite Elizabeth Taylor performances, which is saying a lot because I adore her. She's in my top three favorites. This is some of her strongest acting. And I know that Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, she takes flack for that because A lot of people see that as the Liz and Dick relationship in microcosm. But to watch the films they made in the early 60s, 
Virginia Woolf's a bit of an outlier because they made several films in the 1960s that were all about them being hot and having a lot of sex. I am totally okay with that. It's such a 60s movie. This is also her in some of her most beautiful eras. Her in the 60s, once she starts to get that really nice tan and grow her hair out, it's just such a great look for her. This and the VIPs is prime Elizabeth Taylor. Well, we might be coming back to Elizabeth Taylor at some point on my list. We'll see. Samantha, what is your number three? Speaking of coming back around, we are coming back around to Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. They show up on my list multiple times. I watched Penny Serenade for the first time this year from 1941. I I have not seen this still. Wow. Okay, so I won't spoil. This movie is very infamous in the old Hollywood fandom. Anytime it shows up on TCM, everyone in TCM party is like, bring your tissues. This is going to emotionally break you. And that's exactly what it did. It is such a great romantic movie, but it's so melodramatic. It absolutely tugs at your heartstrings every scene. If I had to compare this movie to anything, this is the beginning scenes of Up stretched into two and a half hours. That's part of why I haven't watched it, because I feel like it would just make me sad. I'm going to be bummed out the entire time. You have to be in the right mindset, but I was watching so many new-to-me Cary Grant movies this year, so many big Cary Grant movies, and I didn't know what to expect from this movie. I was so shocked. I was kicking myself because I've always been very adamant that Cary Grant is far superior in comedies. And on top of that, I'd seen Irene Dunn in six movies before this, but I still had never really thought much of her. Both of their performances surpassed my expectations. It was such an emotional roller coaster, but it was pieced together so beautifully. All of the songs, it's just so worth the watch. Have you seen Make Way for Tomorrow? I don't think I have. Leo McCary. That's the last time I was emotionally devastated by a classic film. If you have the chance, you should definitely watch it. But it's essentially like the beginnings of Up, only they were really old. How Up should have theoretically gone. So future idea if you need more sobbing. But I need to see this. This has been on my list for way too long. It's a great one. So worth it. My number three is... Technically, outside of the purview of our timeline, but if it airs on TCM, we count it on this list. And this actually was also at the TCM Classic Film Festival, although I did not see it there. I saw it after the fact, which honestly, I'm glad I didn't see it there, because if we want to talk about being emotionally devastated by a movie, do I have one for you? My number three comes to us from 1980, and it is Somewhere in Time. Yeah, did you hear about yeah? (laughs) Did you hear about the TCM Film Festival screening of this? I knew that it was screening at the fest. I will say this is definitely an all-time fave. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy! Yeah, I I saw this movie (laughs) forever ago because of the Hotel Coronado. It's one of my favorite places in the world, and that's where it takes place in the book. So yes, I want to hear all your gushing about this movie because it's fantastic. It's so fantastic. And what I appreciated about it was it's got a screenplay by Richard Matheson, who is a sci-fi horror great. And that's what really elevates the movie above just being, oh, time travel romance to its benefit. This stars Christopher Reeve, who plays Richard Collier, who is visiting a hotel and is drawn to a picture of an actress, Elise McKenna, played by Jane Seymour. And conjures up this form of time travel to go back in time to the turn of the century to be with her. That is really as far as I want to go without spoiling the rest of the movie. As much as I gave Christopher Reeve flack when we did our episodes of Double Features on Village of the Damned and Rear Window, he is perfectly suited for something like this. This is not Superman. This is him playing a genuinely fleshed out, fully enriched, enlivened person. He's just a great 
leading man to lead this romance. Jane Seymour is utterly freaking gorgeous. I just could not take my eyes off her. Christopher Plummer plays a cad, which is a lot of fun. What kept the movie going for me was this time travel conceit and the way they utilize it. There is a scene towards the end, and I'm sure you know exactly what part I'm thinking of, that is just, I was watching this at home on my iPad, and when it happened, I was like, what? No! literally upset i was like no this cannot happen i can't fathom what would have happened if i had been in a theater watching this with other people i would have probably just lost my mind because it's so emotionally devastating and the rest of the movie from there just goes one way and you're like well i get it i get it it's just such a rich sumptuous Beautifully filmed movie, beautifully acted. I know we talk about, oh, this movie would never be made today. But honestly, I don't think this movie could ever be made today because we don't tend to make films like this where, yeah, you could probably poke holes in the time travel element of it. But why would you want to? It works just well enough. Exactly. So I thought this was so brilliant. And then I found out afterwards, Jane Seymour was at the film festival to introducing it. She had a really beautiful story about allegedly that her and Christopher Reeve were in love with each other and that it didn't work out. She talked a little bit of trash about his wife. I wasn't really down for that, but she talked about how maybe they'll meet again somewhere in time. People said, if you were in the audience, you were sobbing, you couldn't handle it. I thought this movie was great. I thought this was so good. I was so happy that I discovered this. One of the few times you'll hear me be glad I didn't see it at the film festival because I would have just been a wreck. That's definitely not a good first watch in a theater. I can agree with you. It hits you very hard. It's a perfect movie. I really can't overstate that. Christopher Reeve is, like you said, a fantastic leading man. And I really hadn't seen Jane Seymour in anything else other than this, but she's so great in it. It's one of my favorite books. I went and read the book after this. It's such a short read, too. It's like 150 pages. The only thing that I would change is film it in Coronado because it's so beautiful. They had to change it. I get it. Okay. And also the score. Beautiful score. Yeah. I want to read the novella now because, I mean, I wrote about film adaptations, so I might as well read more of them. But I'm interested to see. I'm interested to see the changes that they would make because so much of the movie's resonance is this turn of the century back east mentality to it that I feel would probably, yeah, be a really different knowing that it's set in California, Coronado. I got the book as a gift while we were in Coronado. I was staying in that hotel and I was sitting in the exact same spot where he says he sits reading the book. It was so crazy. It's A great one. So this is one of those moments where I don't tend to catch up on a lot of stuff the film festival shows, but this is up there with watching the way we were for the first time. Oh my God, that would be a great double feature, actually. I support this. It would! That's right. Those are perfect hand-in-hand movies, now that you mention it. I need a theater so that I can show this. I'm Uh, like, if I added a third, I'd probably throw in the 70s Great Gatsby. Oh, yes. Okay, well, the 70s Great Gatsby is my favorite Gatsby. No disrespect to Leo, but he ain't holding a candle to Robert Redford. (laughs) Samantha, what's your number two? My number two, it might not be that surprising if you've listened to our episodes from 2022. I had a huge Vincent Price deep dive this year. I watched 10 movies over the course of one weekend that I had never seen before. I had never seen any of them before. And I had seen 20 of his movies prior to that. So that made 30 Vincent Price movies total that I've seen now. But this went right up to my number two for the whole year, Dragon Wick from 1946. Yeah. This movie, if we're being honest with each other, this is my number one in terms of this is my teddy bear of a movie that I want to just hold to my chest and watch over and over again. <laughs> It's that perfect gothic horror romance that I just eat up. Gene Tierney and Vincent Price, as we talked about in our Vincent Price episode, play off of each other so perfectly. They were perfectly cast together. 
it's so great. I don't even know how to top everything that we said in our episode about it. It's so good. It's the gold standard for gothic romance. Vincent Price is really the only person that can make heroin addict look good i forget what he's addicted to in that but he on drugs they never say <laughs> they, ne- they just say drugs he could be a laudanum addict that time period he, so he could have be. been huffing paint paint <laughs> drinking straight morphine i don't know opium Moonshine. or something either way he makes addiction look great good for vincent this one i've seen a couple of times it's one of the reasons i miss the gothic element and also i why we love classic film you wouldn't be able to make this type of movie with this elegance. I know a lot of people love Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak, but I don't know. There's just something about this movie that works so well, even though it doesn't necessarily have anything spooky. It's not like Jane Eyre where there's crazy wife living in the attic. It's just good old fashioned broken people hurting other people. I know. I really didn't know what to expect. And I hate to repeat everything I said in the episode, but What surprised me the most was that watching a movie like Laura, where Vincent is the outcast and he doesn't really know anything or hold a job, and Jean Tierney is this intelligent woman of the world, and then you've got Dragonwick, where Vincent Price is this intelligent man of the world, and Jean Tierney is from the small town and doesn't know anything or have any social skills. So it's really fascinating. But they play all of these roles so well. It's almost like a precursor to Tess of the D'Urbervilles, if anybody wants to get For sure. literary about it. But biggest thing, and I know one of the criticisms of the movie from at least modern audiences that watch it, is that they don't believe that Jean Tierney is some babe in the woods. That's hard for me to believe, which I get. I do get. too. That's why we watch these movies, because we don't want to see some plain country girl. We want glitz, damn it. We want glamour. We want Jean Tierney. And we Vincent want Price. Jean Tierney, yes. Speaking of glitz and glamour, my number two is a doozy. My number two is one that you brought up to me back when we did our Elizabeth Taylor episode. And I told you I hadn't seen it. And now I have seen it. And now I love it so much. I don't want to know a world before I saw this movie. It is from 1963. It is The VIPs. (laughs) That makes me so happy. I don't know what I expected, and what I got was just a hodgepodge of deliciousness. Written by Terrence Radigan, who did The Prince and the Showgirl, which is another 1960s movie that I absolutely love. It feels like you're watching a really, really expensive, sumptuous soap opera. It tells the story of a bunch of travelers that are going to New York City that are hanging out in the lounge of London's Heathrow Airport, and all of them have a bevy of personal problems that they are bringing with them. Some of them are really interesting. Some of them are less than. This is a film that has a cast that includes Maggie Smith and Orson Welles, Rod Taylor. I don't really give two wits about either of any of those people. Rod Taylor doing an Australian accent. We have to specify for people who have just seen Rod Taylor and the birds. I was shocked. I think that was the most shocking thing was hearing his original accent come out of his mouth. I know he's Australian, but it's one thing to know it and another to hear it. Exactly. It was shocking, but it was great. He sounds so crazy. And Maggie Smith is his long-suffering secretary. And I'm just like, Maggie, girl, come on, you can do better. No disrespect to the Rod Taylor fans out there. Orson Welles is playing a director, not unlike numerous other directors. Not really unlike Orson Welles. He's a guy that can't get financing. No, he's just playing himself. The joy of the VIPs is the thruple love triangle situation that exists between Liz Taylor, Richard Burton, and Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan doesn't have, much like Eva Marie Saint, he has not a shot. I love Louis Jordan. Okay, he's great. As a threesome, they are just too hot. Too hot. The world would implode. But the man just really should have given up after about five minutes and just been like, you know what? There's nothing that's going to work here. A lot of it supposedly is based on Liz and Dick's own marital relationship, the jealousy and They said that they would actually borrowed from the fact that he would buy her jewelry just because it was Wednesday. The little notes that they would write to each other. 
if we're talking about themes of my movies this year, thirsty, everything was thirsty. And this is the thirstiest movie of pretty much everything because everybody is impossibly, impossibly gorgeous. Richard Burton's wearing this just coat that is fantastic. His hair is on point. Liz Taylor's got gowns that a normal person is not wearing that she swapped in fur. It is utterly fantastic. And then once things start fighting, I'm just like, I love both of you right now and I don't really know what to do with myself. <laughs> And her own jewelry, we have to add, which looks so incredible. Her own collection. Just some of the best moments on screen, truly, for her. It is so great. I wish that this had been a 10-part miniseries because I'd have watched every single minute of it. I was riveted to this movie the entire time. So once again, Samantha Ellis jumping in with the suggestions that end up on my best of the year list. I love to hear it. That makes me so happy. This is my most liked review in all of Letterboxd is for this film. And this is what I said. This is the whole review. Elizabeth Taylor's wardrobe and jewelry earn a star. The fact that this is probably the loveliest she ever appeared on film earns a star. Rod Taylor's Australian accent earns a star. The fact that Louis Jordan is in this earns a star. Hence, four stars. I don't make the rules. I would say (laughs) the fact that Richard Burton just looks as hot as his wife is at least three stars. I love Anne of the Thousand Days. Never in my wildest dreams would I tell you that Richard Burton is gorgeous in that. But no, we were all watching the wrong movies because the man was fine. And I don't really know what to do with that information at, at this point. The VIPs. It's great. Go watch it. It's awesome. Let's read some of our listener suggestions we got before we get into our honorable mentions and our number ones, of course. Thank you to everybody that sent in suggestions and answered my prompt of what were your favorite classic films. TCM Party, our friends over at TCM Party said, this is a great question. This is off the top of my head in no particular order. Blast of Silence, Battling Butler, Beverly of Grostark, Hit and Run from 1957, the Bribe, and 1929's Woman in the Moon. Melanie Marquita said, Nightmare Alley, completely floored by Tyrone Power's performance as Stanton Carlyle, all cynicism and coiled tension and calculated charm. I knew he could act. This was something else. Joan Blondell, Colleen Gray, and Helen Walker are excellent, but it's Ty's movie, and does he deliver? Bob K. said, Roman Holiday. At Laura Burke Halter said The Naked Kiss, Dr. X, and Vampire were my new faves. Sean Patrick at Critic Sean said May West, I'm No Angel, Lestrada and John Huston's Moulin Rouge. Terrence Hiltz at Cooler Hiltz said For me, I'm going with The Flight of the Phoenix, wonderful cast led by the excellent James Stewart, plus an interesting premise about a crew stranded in a desert trying to make a new plane out of a crushed one. I've heard many great things about all of those movies. Thank you to everybody that answered. So let's get into our number one. Samantha, what was your number one for 2022? This might be a surprise to people who don't know me, but I have a huge, huge respect for Louise Reiner. And this year was a huge Louise Reiner year for me. I watched most of the studio films that she made, not quite all of them because I don't want to blow through them all super quickly. I watched a good amount. I watched The Toy Wife for the first time this year. I watched The Big City for the first time this year. I watched The Emperor's Candlesticks for the first time this year. But my number one film for the entire year is Dramatic School from 1938. This movie has Louise Reiner, it has Paulette Goddard, and it has Alan Curtis. So really interesting cast. It just shows Louise's genuine acting ability she really acted with all of her emotions and so from the heart there's one scene in it in which she makes a wish before she makes a toast and the whole movie is basically about her character she wants to be an actress she's attending this prestigious dramatic school but She's a total fake. She's not this wealthy debutante like everybody else. She's actually a factory worker. She tries to fit in. She pretends that she is dating one of the most famous bachelors and actors in the area. And she's not. 
but she's trying to lie and skate by. In the end, it turns out that everything that she wanted is being handed to her. They end up accepting her. This guy actually wants to date her. I hate to spoil this 80-year-old movie, but I'm going to (laughs) because this is the reason why I really love it. In the end, Louise chooses herself. She decides not to date anyone. She decides to follow her aspirations of being an actress. And she grabs her friend from the factory and they go and see her name in lights after everyone has gone. That scene just ripped my heart out. Women supporting women and it's women supporting themselves. I love it. And I can't recommend this movie enough. It really goes under the rug. People don't talk about it at all. If you read Janine Basinger's new oral history of Hollywood, she has some director of this era talking about Louise Reiner in that movie that made me think of you. That's something to consider checking out afterwards. My number one is as far afield from that film as we could probably get, which is odd because I've spent this entire episode talking about swoony romances and ghosts. My number one is not any of those things. So I spent a lot of this year watching Sidney Poitier movies. He passed away last year. And so I really made an effort to watch some great Sydney films. As soon as I saw it, I was like, this is going to be my best of the year. I don't know anything that's going to top it. Mind you, I have an honorable mention that's also a Sydney film that I wish I could have included. But this one's from 1972. It was actually his directorial debut. It's Buck and the Preacher. I need everybody to go see it right now because it is so damn brilliant. It is freaking amazing. I loved every second of this. Sidney Poitier plays the aforementioned Buck. He is a wagon master that is trying to get freed slaves to the north. They're being corralled by racist Southern people that want to send them back to the South, or in many cases, take freed people and take them back for slave purposes. He's got a lot on his plate. He meets a guy known as the Preacher, played by Harry Belafonte, who was a con man. The two essentially go on the spree. It is just utterly, to call it revolutionary, probably somebody would say that other movies have done this before, and, and I'm sure that they're right. But watching this, watching Sidney Poitier, a man who has a very complicated film persona and didn't do a lot of political films, at least tried to be apolitical for much of his studio career, make a movie about two Black men trying to get other Black people to the West. It's amazing to watch. And Harry Belafonte has probably one of the best introductions of a character, even though they try very, very hard to unglamorize him and make him look really unattractive. He's got so much charm and charisma that Sidney Poitier is is the straight man. He's the guy that's all seriousness, where Harry Belafonte is all smiles and trying to get one over on people. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of heart. Ruby D is also in this as just a total badass. I kept analyzing little bits of this movie. There's interesting elements that they include with indigenous characters the racism that was going on between them as they create this hierarchy of who's more important in this brave new world. It was just a movie that left me thinking. It's wonderfully acted. It's action-packed. I just loved this movie so, so freaking much. And wouldn't you know, Criterion just put out the movie on Criterion Blu-ray and DVD. So I would just say blind buy it. It's that good. It's so, so good. I have not seen this yet. I am so ashamed. Samantha, middle name, Ellis, you need to do this. (laughs) I know, I know. Sidney Poitier, he's obviously one of my all-time favorites. Absolutely shattered my heart. I still cannot get over his passing this past year. It broke me. I'm going to complete his filmography someday. I have said this before on the podcast. I am sticking to it. So this isn't one of those, oh, yeah, I want to see this movie sometime. I'm going to see that movie sometime. (laughs) And I will report back how it is. It's so good. It's so good. If anything, it made me realize I also need to see more Harry Belafonte movies because he is also really good and still with us. I saw some new to me Sydney Poitier as well. I saw Night in the City, which I really liked. I saw Pressure Point. And I saw Goodbye, My Lady, but I did not see Buck and the Preacher. That was one that I 
curve to watch some of the other ones, but uh, it's worth it. it. Honorable mentions. I can read my full list over at ticklishbiz.com. I also had Queen Bee from 1955 with Joan Crawford. This was a TCM film festival watch and never have I heard an audience gasp so loud than when Joan Crawford rears up and slaps a woman like she does in this movie. Another Sidney Poitier movie, 1973's A Warm December, which is another romance. Sidney Poitier plays a widower who falls in love with a woman who has sickle cell anemia. Really sad and romantic, and he's gorgeous. Esther Anderson is gorgeous. This is another one that you should definitely go see if you haven't seen it already. I watched a lot of Akira Kurosawa, Toshiro Mufune movies this year, and 1950s Scandal plays like it should be a romance, but it's actually a very, very sad, sweet, introspective story about people looking for connection. We certainly need that these days, so I would definitely recommend that. Tony Curtis in Don't Make Waves from 1967. It's fun. It's silly. And Jeff Bridges in Hearts of the West in 1975. This is a far better movie than Babylon. If you want to see a movie about the joy of making movies, Jeff Bridges plays a guy who becomes a silent era cowboy in silent westerns. It's really, really great. I have a lot of other honorable mentions. A lot of Elvis movies made my honorable list. So head on over to ticklishbiz.com and you can read the full list. Samantha, any honorables for you that you want to give a shout out to? I do. I'm going to try to read through them as fast as I can because I saw so many huge movies this year. Midnight from 1939. Claudette Colbert, she's been such a roller coaster with me. We share a birthday, so I felt obligated to love her, but now I genuinely love her. (laughs) Arsenic and Old Lace I saw for the first time this year, which is so shocking. I know. Hollywood Hotel, so many great little Old Hollywood pop culture references in that movie, but the blackface ruins. <laughs> Other than that, it would be my number one for the year, probably. Grand Hotel I saw for the first time this year. Paths of Glory, Chance at Heaven with Joel McRae and Ginger Rogers. After Tonight, I had a huge Constance Bennett discovery, and I saw her grave for the first time this year. Mark of Zorro, the original one with Douglas Fairbanks Sr., which was so amazing. Best Years of Our Lives, I had never seen before this year. And it didn't go super high for me, which was so shocking, but I did love it. Moby Dick, the original John Barrymore. The Old Dark House, I had never seen. That is a stacked cast and just a really great 30s horror. Night Song with Merle Oberon and Dana Andrews. The Unsuspected with Claude Rains. Death on the Nile, ridiculous cast. We've talked about Inside Easy Clover. I saw that for the first time this year with Natalie Wood. And my last one is, I don't know if it counts. This is really out of left field as time-wise. I have to say, we're an old Hollywood podcast, so I would be remiss if I didn't say that I saw and loved the last movie stars. It's so good. It's so good. TCM also did some really great modern films. It's in my long list, but they also did TCM import show Chungking Express, which is a Wong Kar Rai film from the 90s. If you have not seen it, you should. I've heard good things. It's so good. It's so good. So this year, I think it was really good to be a classic film fan, even though we all had to suffer through Blonde and Babylon. (laughs) (laughs) We seem to be in a very romantical mood. We both picked a lot of romance films. I always do. That's weird for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to tell the universe something. Listeners, you can let us know your film discoveries that you discovered this year that you loved. I can't wait to see what we discover in the process of recording new episodes in 2023. That's going to close out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get podcasts. Remember, reviews matter, so please leave us one on Apple Podcasts. Five stars should do. You can follow us on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklish biz. You can follow me over at Twitter at journeys underscore film. Samantha, where are you? Anything you want to shout out? As always, you can mostly find me at Classic Film Geek on Twitter, but you can also find me at that handle on TikTok. And Instagram, you can find my blog at musingsofclassicfilmatic.com and my Cooking with the Stars post at classicmoviehub.com. And remember, our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances 
to do new content like our six weeks with the Thin Man series and the numerous merchandise that we are crafting over at our Red Bubble shop. Consider helping us out at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. My book, but have you read the book, is out March 7th. You can pre-order it wherever you buy books. We will be back on February 1st, kicking off the month of February with a celebration of King Kong's 90th anniversary. Till then.